four. The broadcast three, is now starting. All two, attendees are in listen only one. mode. Hello and welcome to our ABCs of launching a HIPAA compliance initiative. Getting started. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney uh, and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Before going over the agenda, uh, just for those of you that are new, we um, tend to like to make this conversational, and so we will accept questions that you can submit via chat to uh, Martin Wynn, our, our Director of Operations, and he will field those questions and interrupt me at the appropriate time, or I will just stop and ask Martin, do we have any uh, questions when we get to a, a logical uh, place to um, where we wrap something up. So that's how we handle it, but we do do QA at the end as well. So the agenda today is to define what is a comprehensive initiative, to discuss the partial solutions that are everywhere uh, related to HIPAA compliance. Uh, those are not comprehensive. They're useful, but they're not comprehensive, and you just need to understand the difference. And the components of coverage or the components of a comprehensive initiative, which we think are education requirements, uh, having step-by-step -step guidance and adhering to a robust methodology. So the learning objectives for today is to provide a foundational understanding of the requirements for a comprehensive HIPAA compliance initiative. And the requirements is something uh, that we're going to hit on over and over again throughout this uh, webinar because it's really all about requirements and understanding the requirements and complying with the requirements and not guessing as to what the requirements are. So we're going to define a comprehensive initiative. We're going to talk a, a, a fair amount about what is not comprehensive, the key components of coverage, while you have to track your progress against requirements at that level of granularity, and a little bit about systems thinking and how to, not how uh, how not to chase your HIPAA tail as you unroll your initiative. So bottom line is we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your compliance initiative should be based on full coverage of HIPAA requirements and what that entails really from a practical perspective. So comprehensive is comprehensiveness uh, defined and um, HIPAA is actually quite large. It encompasses, as most of you know, a lot more than privacy and security. But uh, for our purposes today, we're focused on the privacy and security part. And so we're going to cover comprehensiveness from our perspective means fully covering the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the high-tech breach notification rule, which you know we call the high-tech container. This is These are the pieces that you have to address in order to fully comply. And again, we like to use this equation to illustrate how you go about complying. You have to have policies, and you have to have a set of uh, organizational processes that underpin the policies. Otherwise, the policies really are just flowery language, they don't mean all that much. And you have to have a way to track process results. So if you have policies and processes and tracking uh, and the ability to track process results, then you have visible, demonstrable evidence, and you're on your way to establishing a culture of compliance. And for the purposes of today's webinar, um, you need to be thinking about VDE or visible, demonstrable evidence at the granularity of a requirement. That's how you get comprehensive coverage of the requirements, and that's how you can feel comfortable that you have adequately dealt with the requirements in preparation for, uh, God forbid, an OCR audit, or if you have a breach or you have a lawsuit, then you're actually going to have to um, go produce this evidence. Now, just a, um, a, a notification, I hope uh, everybody understands that uh, HHS has made quite clear that audits are going to start uh, again. I, I think there were 800 covered entities selected, 400 business associates selected, those are going to be uh, moving forward in 2014. Um, one of the regional directors for OCR said they're going to continue to be and increase their level of aggressiveness uh, in enforcement 
they're incented to do so because a little a little discussed fact that's not widely known is that all the proceeds from the fines levied by HHS go back to OCR OCR's coffers for more enforcement action, hiring more staff, and or to use in whatever manner they see fit. So expect that the um, the amount of enforcement to increase, and obviously that's that's um, that's a quantification that is outside of breaches that are going to continue to occur. These are just efforts that uh, HHS is going to make on their own. So your compliance program, and it really is a program that you need to be thinking about, must allow you to produce and track BDE for each requirement of the HIPAA rules, and you know, it obviously begs the question. How do I know what the requirements are? So here it is. As a practical matter, this means you must have a clear understanding of each requirement for the three rules, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. You must be able to show VDE for each requirement. If you currently can't show VDE for each requirement, you must have a plan in place for achieving the same. Hey, we've covered these requirements. We're working on these other requirements. And if you can do that, then you can show that um, HHS or a court of law that you're making a good faith effort to comply, and hopefully that's enough to get out of a finding of willful neglect, which is where the worst fines are to be found. Now, items two and three mandate, obviously, that you have the ability to track progress at the granularity level of a requirement. So it's all about requirements. Now, Here's the thing. Prior to the High Tech Act, there was all kinds of myth-making, HIPAA myth-making about how to prepare for an OCR audit, which were never uh, really um, promulgated. You know, it, it, before the High Tech Act, HIPAA was a paper tiger that wasn't enforced. But you know, there was at one point threats of an audit, and there were these 42 questions that you had to be able to answer. And even today, there's still a lot of uh, mystery around what are the requirements. And I, I, one of the things that we want to attempt in this webinar is to demystify that, because it's not all that mystical. You just If you methodically walk through the rules, you will find the requirements. And for each one of the requirements, you need to have a process and an ability to track. And we'll show you how we've gotten there um, as an illustration. So Martin, are there any questions? Uh, after that short introduction. Yes, there's just one, and I need clarification on it. Um, a gentleman asked if they'd get copies uh, of the slides. I was not, I was pretty sure you had already sent them out. Uh, yeah, I did send out the slides yesterday. Most of you should have gotten them. Uh, check your um, spam folder or your junk folder, and you know, if, you, if you registered late, um, you may not have gotten them if you registered yesterday afternoon, in which case you'll have to uh, ping us after the webinar and we'll, we'll send them to you. And okay. that's, that's what we got. Okay. So OCR put out a um, what they called audit protocols broken up by the three legs of the high-tech container stool, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. And as you can see here are, for the privacy rule, are um, the audit protocols for what we call uses and disclosures. And that is ranging from 164.502 to 164.514. And it's 51. Uh, requirements. Now, when we get to our checklist, as an example of how we provide coverage, we don't match it one for one because a lot of times we will consolidate, um, for example, the 10 requirements for 514. We might consolidate that into a, a, a checklist item that covers all of that, right? But this is, this is sort of the universe of requirements, okay, for those three legs of the stool. These are the requirements for, under the privacy rule, what we call the patient's bill of rights. Now, 
don't go looking for the patient's bill of rights in the rule or in anything HHS says. That's something we coined to describe these sections of the privacy rule that essentially give patients due process. They have to be notified. They, ha they have a right to have access to their medical records. They have an access, uh, right to modify their medical records, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And in response, the covered entity has obligations to fulfill in certain periods of time. If you get a request, you can't just uh, reply in any old time that you like. You actually got 30 days, and if you don't, to, you know, for a medical records, and if you don't respond in 30 days, you better respond with a writing that says, "Can I have an extension, Mr. Patient or Ms. Patient?" Uh, and and you have to put provide that to the patient in writing, and you have to tell the patient when, now that you're asking for an extension, when you are going to deliver um, the records. I can assure you that uh, there are a lot of major organizations that don't have mature processes in place and just don't understand the patient's bill of rights. Recently there was a large, large provider out of the West Coast, I'm not going to name names, uh, but they're really, really big, and they had the requirements for their online portal uh, as far as when they were going to provide records uh, really totally whacked out with respect to what was required by the rules, right? So if you have an online portal, one of the things is that you have to provide your notice of privacy practices on that online portal for a first-time patient, and you have to respond with medical records and everything else, everything you have to do in uh, in the paper world, you still have to do online if you have a portal. So if, if, if the biggest of the biggest don't have a robust understanding of the patient's bill of rights, then uh, I can imagine what the rest of the healthcare industry, what state that's in. Now, why would, why would the healthcare industry be lagging with respect to the patient's bill of rights? Because historically, nobody asked for their records. And historically, prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was a paper tiger that was unenforced, so there was no need. So there may be many of you that think you have, in fact, the privacy rule covered uh, when you don't. So we'd encourage you to go back and, and revisit these sections. And finally, there are the administrative requirements under the privacy rule, uh, training, documentation, sanctions, etc. Okay, so those are the 81 requirements. That's the universe. It, it's not any larger than that. It's not any smaller than that. That's the universe of privacy rule requirements that you need to be able to show visible demonstrable evidence for if you want to show coverage. Okay. So moving on to the security rule, as many of you know, the security rule is broken up into safeguards, administrative safeguards, technical safeguards, physical safeguards, and again, the audit protocol has it has it broken down by the security rule, and these are the administrative safeguards. There's 38 of them requirements, and we'll show that uh, when it comes to our checklist and our coverage of the security rule, we actually expand. We actually wind up with more checklist items in the security rule because there's more process-oriented things that you have embedded in the security rule that requires more detail uh, in order to get the coverage. So. Uh, yet, it's still not one for one. Uh, we do get coverage, but the, numerically it's still not one for one. So then you have the technical safeguards, right, which are about 20 some odd. Uh, and then you have physical safeguards, and we broke them up. See, the numbers aren't really matching here because here's 38, and then here's 54, and then here's 39 because I, I tend to choose the physical safeguards as the last safeguards. You know, do do the administrative safeguards. That's eighty percent of the security rule. That's where your risk assessment is. That's where your risk management program is. Do the technical safeguards that you need to have in place: automatic long log, log off, strong passwords, all that sort of thing. And then, you know, obviously you're responsible for all of it. But if you're trying to take a a a, a chunk out of time. Then you can worry about the physical plant and equipment uh, safeguards, locks on server room doors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So 
Now, for breach notification, breach notification is a little bit of a different animal. You can see here there's a lot less requirements. There's actually 10. Um, and the way you approach breach notification as far as being prepared to show visible demonstrable evidence is slightly different just because the breach notification rule is a slightly different kind of rule. So it's all about the requirements. The privacy rule has 81. The security, security rule has 78. And the breach notification rule has 10. It's 169 requirements that you need to track if you're going to provide comprehensive coverage. So I'm going to pause here just to see if there's any questions. Does everybody understand what, what we're doing here? We have one question, uh, which is a good question. For a BA, would the privacy rule requirements in this exercise be less? I would say no, not, not necessarily, not per se. Okay, there is no business associate rule light. I mean, you're still, there. It, well, let, let me say this. Yes, to the degree, to the, depending on the type of business associate that you are, right, you're, you're, for example, business associates don't have a need to provide notice of privacy practices. And business associates may or may not, depending on what they do, be required to amend uh, or provide access to PHI, but they might. And that would be covered in the business associate contract, and that would largely depend on whether a business associate is uh, maintaining, storing uh, PHI on behalf of the covered entity. So, uh, yeah, the, the, it's it's possible that it's going to be less, but it's not it's not like business associates can uh, ignore the privacy rule because some some fair majority is, uh, are required. Everything regarding uses and disclosures pertain to the business associate, okay? There are some things in the patient's bill of rights uh, that just depends on the relationship, whether those are going to apply, and the documentation uh, requirements are going to be similar. So I would say there's, you know, even in the best case, there's probably 60 out of the 81. I'm just taking a guess here. That would be applicable. Uh, another question, and are these requirements listed in the HIPAA survival guide? Uh, I'm not, I need some clarification whether the person is asking, are they listed in the HIPAA survival guide website or the HIPAA survival guide uh, e-book overview or what? Okay, well, when that comes in, I will... I'm waiting here patiently for a moment to see if we get a uh, clarification. Uh, well, the the answer is the answer is no, actually, in either <laughs> case. These requirements come from the OCR protocol that that OCR released. They OCR, right? The Office of Civil Rights released this uh, this audit pro protocol. It's 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 available publicly in a spreadsheet format. You can download you can download it. You can get this. This is what's where I got it. Okay, now the question may be: In our checklist, do we provide coverage of these requirements? And the answer to that is yes, and we're we're going to get to that. But that's not really that's in our product. That's in our security rule checklist, our privacy rule checklist, in our breach notification framework. Which, if you were going to buy all three, you'd be just well buy the uh, subscription plan because it would cost about as much, and you get all the training and and everything else, but we're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, anything else? That's, that's all we have for the moment, except someone gets visible demonstrative evidence. That's what it says. Got it. Visible demonstrative evidence. In other words, show them what you got. Right. you got to be able to show them. Exactly. Okay, so partial solutions are everywhere, right? It, it, we're going to talk about comprehension, but I want to talk a little bit about partial solutions because there's a lot of people selling partial solutions as if they were complete solutions, and so it's caveat emptor, it's buyer beware, and, and, that, and partial solutions may be quite helpful, but you need to understand that you're buying a partial solution and not the entirety of your program. That's 
what we're trying to get to today, and that's what we're trying to illustrate, the difference between one and the other. So if you don't think about your program strategically, holistically, the big picture, the fact that you've got to deal with these 169 requirements, you could proceed and die a death of a thousand cuts because you, you, you'll wind up picking this partial solution for this, that partial solution for that. None of them really uh, talk to each other. There's no comprehensiveness there. There's really no coverage. And it's a hodgepodge of things that you have that now becomes your problem to figure out how how you can use this hodgepodge to reply to these uh, or address these 169 requirements. So I want to go through a little bit about this wetware versus software because there's a lot of vendors out there that will say they have software and you know that they provide you coverage. Well, let me first just describe the difference between wetware, what we call wetware, and software. Wetware is biological gray matter in a fixed medium suitable for other humans to consume. Okay, well, Carlos, what the hell does that mean? Well, first of all, it's not software. It's not software. Wetware is what you need to know in order to comply with high-tech HIPAA, the big picture. Wetware is understanding those 169 requirements and understanding how you might go about developing a policy for that each requirement, developing a set of processes that underpin, underpin each requirement, and developing tracking mechanisms to track each requirement. That is understanding the big, big picture. Now, uh, most software is not going to give you that because the software vendors are focused on features and functionality and a lot of things that may be useful to you, but generally it's not the wetware that you need to acquire this kind of understanding. So we like to think of wetware as a knowledge transfer vehicle and its focus is on education, educating you on what that big picture is. Software generally is where you store and manage your VDE, your visible demonstrable evidence of high tech, high tech HIPAA compliance. And compliance software, when it's done well, should be much more than a file repository. I mean, after all, we can show you, we can, we can probably do, we'll take a show of hands at the end of, uh, uh, or we could do it right now, how many people would like to see a file repository webinar where we can show you how to put together a file repository, whether it's on a network server, whether it's on SharePoint, whether it's in Google Apps, that would serve as a more than useful file repository. So. You, you can almost get a decent file repository for free. So software should be much more than that. It should help you actually effectively manage your compliance initiative. So once you understand what the requirements are and what you're supposed to do, compliance software should help you manage that. Now, we like to think compliance software without wetware is really an empty container. If you have all these buckets and places that you can put things, but you don't know what to put where, and you don't understand how to go about fulfilling these 169 requirements, I would suggest to you that the software is not going to do you very much good. Now, here's the thing, and here's why some partial solutions in, in, in the terms of software are sold as comprehensive solutions, because most of the software vendors have gotten pretty smart, and they say, well, we have these templates, and we have these forms, and you can use that, but if you dig deeper, and start asking, well, do you have something that covers all 169 requirements? And show me where, where that is. And how, show me the process that underpins requirement X, Y, Z. And you're going to quickly find out that they don't have that. They have these templates and these things that, have, you know, that, that, that they've done, but that's sort of like a bait and switch. What they're really selling is the software. They're not really selling keeping up with the HIPAA requirements, despite the fact that some of those tools and templates may be helpful to you. They're not intended uh, to provide uh, coverage and they're usually the software vendors are not in the business of completely keeping up with the requirements of the privacy rule, the security rule and the breach notification rule and a great example of that is when the omnibus rule came out Right, and the omnibus rule came out last January 2013. It went into effect September 2013. We had to change every one of our products to reflect the omnibus rule requirements. The omnibus rule touched every single one of our products, every single checklist, 
every single training, right? Because that's the business that we're in. We're in the wetware business. We had absolutely had to do that, right? And so one of the questions you could ask is, okay, are your templates, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, software vendor, are your templates now all, uh, A, are they all omnibus rule ready? And B, do they, do they cover the 169 requirements? Those would be good questions to ask. So, com so caveat emptor compliance software is often sold as wetware. Now, here are other software solutions more uh, specialized, right, that uh, attempt to indicate that they're solving the problem. So you can buy software that helps you with risk assessments. You can buy software that helps you with incident management. You can buy software that is nothing more than a file repository. You can buy automated privacy verification. You can buy software that helps you with security incident tracking, network monitoring, intrusion detection. These are all point solutions. Okay, and some of them you're going to have to have. But I don't really, you know, my 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 position is you can't really do an effective uh, risk assessment without some kind of network monitoring tool and without an intrusion detection tool. So these are enabling technologies that will help you do certain parts of and meet certain parts of the requirements. But the point is, don't buy these point solutions thinking that you're getting a comprehensive solution, because you're not. You've got to ask a lot of questions. And the key is to have this understanding of the big picture so that you can not then understand where these point solutions actually do fit within that framework and make sense for you. So there's partial solutions related to consultants. So some consultants might come in and do a gap analysis and remediation. Some con uh, consultants focus purely on breach notifications, on forensics, on the process, on public relations after a breach, on legal. Some focus on disaster recovery and business continuity. And by the way, just a housekeeping item, next um, month's webinar is going to focus on, on business continuity under the HIPAA security rule. Um, I believe we, we try to do these the third Thursday of every month. I believe Martin, and that's July, July seventeenth. Is that correct? I've yes, that is one. correct. No, not lost. <laughs> okay. Uh, some solution from consulting focused on training, development, and execution, social media, cloud computing, etc. Now there's training solutions. So there's the old feel good, dumbed down training. If you wouldn't say it in an elevator, you know, what everybody used to do prior to the high tech act. There's certification training. And then there's quality standalone training, but really it's not part of compl a complete program. Okay? So there are hundreds, literally, of point solutions available for you to choose from. And uh, it really is a maze to try to figure out what uh, what it is that you're buying. So um, any any questions after going through that? Uh, nothing at this point, but a, a repository would be a good webinar. OK, great. Well, let's get a show of hands. How many people think that that, that would be good? Martin, are you getting a show of hands? Yeah, I did. Uh, I, um, as far as I can tell, uh, basically it's a good deal. Uh, the hands go up and go down. I guess they, they go up and down by themselves. So, yes, we have a show of hands that's significant. Okay. Okay, so these are components that we think make up a comprehensive initiative. Starts with education, core training, the High Tech Act, the Omnibus Rule, privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, and business associates. Now, let's just talk about these. Obviously, we have the three legs of the stool, privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rule. We also have the High Tech Act, because everything in the omnibus rule, although most people, uh, you know, that don't pay as much attention to this stuff as us legal uh, wonky people, didn't realize that the omnibus rule was really not a rule. It was really a modification to the privacy rule, the security rule, well, the final modifications to the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule, and the enforcement rule. And the reason that we don't 
show the enforcement rule is because by the time you need enforcement, you're, you're talking to your counsel. So that's not something you need to train your staff on. That's something that um, if you're the compliance officer, you, under, you need to understand so you can communicate it to the uh, executive team. But, um, but the omnibus rule modified those four rules, and it modified them based on the mandate in the High Tech Act. So it wasn't the omnibus rule that was really transformative. It was the High Tech Act that was promulgated in 2009 that forced all of these changes and forced HHS to come up with the omnibus rule because it was HHS and OCR were mandated to uh, perform rulemaking based on the High Tech Act. So, uh, and business associates is such a large, important concept that it requires some that we think is part of the core training. Now, there's other training, though. That's the core training. Obviously, everybody struggles with this thing of risk assessment, with risk management, and understanding the difference because HHS and the security rule didn't really make it all that clear because in the first standard, they have an implementation specification called risk assessment, which is required, and then they have a next implementation specification called risk management, which is also required, but the first step in risk management is perform a risk assessment. So it's kind of recursive. It was not sure why uh, HHS OCR decided to do it that way other than to highlight risk assessment as, you know what, you got to have at least one baseline risk assessment. You're definitely going to be in, in willful neglect. And then as part of the risk management program, and really that risk management, that is where the program requirement comes into uh, the security rule. And it swallows the rule. It swallows all three of the rules. That risk management program the second implementation specification of standard one of the administrative safeguards is becomes the entirety of your program. Okay, now it's not uh, written as such, but when you read into it that this is where the ongoing process uh, is defined and what you have to do, you realize that okay, this is this is the requirement that says you need to launch a program, not uh, in that and you need to launch a program, and within that program, you need to comply with these 169 requirements. Now, we have social media because this is really a nuanced area that requires special attention, so therefore special training. Mobile, bring your own device, all kinds of problems with mobiles. They get lost, stolen, you, you know, you have to remote wipe them. They're a mess. They're a breach waiting to happen, and so that's a specialized area. Cloud computing. The same thing, the, the movement to the cloud by the healthcare industry uh, is going to re remain um, fast-paced, if not accelerated. Cloud computing economics are far too compelling for any industry to ignore, but there are problems. There are really big problems, mostly contractual, moving to the cloud, despite the fact that Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are now willing to sign business associate agreement. That's really the least of your worries. The, the, the bigger worries is what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if your cloud comp, uh, provider goes out of business? How do you get your data? How do you get the application running? All these sorts of things are more contractual in nature uh, and different than what everybody else is focused on is, is the security of the cloud. I can tell you that I run my law practice using Google Apps, and I have for over five years. And I'm more, much more comfortable that they provide better security than I could provide than I could provide on my local network. So I'm not worried because that's a that's a bet the company initiative for Google, for Amazon, and for Microsoft. They got world talent, uh, world class engineering talent available. Whenever they have a security issue, you know they're on it, right? They're they're, they're going to do a better job than almost anybody else on the planet. But problem is that you're entrusting them with your data and if when things change what happens and then there's certification training uh, and that's a big deal because just certification is, is a big deal in general for people within the healthcare industry bottom line is that post the high tech act more compliance literacy is required by everybody by the privacy officer the security officer the executive team the nurse all the docs, everybody needs to be more literate. And this is really not the way things were approached in the old HIPAA days, okay? Nobody really cared. You got this feel-good training, yeah, we got our training, blah, blah, blah. That's it. That, that's not 
that's not the world that we live in today. The the uh, millions of dollars of reach, um, fines that can be imposed, uh, the loss of reputation, the fact that consumers have gotten a lot smarter because of breaches like at Target. We live in a different world that requires more compliance literacy. Okay, any questions here? Not yet. All right, so we're going to talk about an approach, and we're going to use what we do, uh, because that's what we're familiar with, as a way for you to think about how do you get coverage of these requirements. We've identified 169. All right, and we have, let me point out a couple of things. We have, for our privacy rule, what we attempted in privacy rule is to go down requirement by requirement and provide a list of checklist items, okay? And this is just a summary here. And you, this is uses and disclosures 101, uses and disclosures 2, second requirement, uses and disclosure 3, all right? So we broke them down in, in this presentation the same way that we broke down the OCR, the OCR protocols. We broke those down into uses and disclosures, uh, patient's bill of rights, and administrative. And that, that's how these are broken down. If you click on... Um, this book on the right, you can go take a tour and look inside our privacy rule checklist to get a lot better feel of what, what you're getting when you buy that. Now, I believe, I haven't checked recently because mostly we sell the subscription plan for $7.95, but I think this HIPAA privacy rule checklist by itself sells for $229.95, I believe that's what it is. Now, here's some more of the requirements. This is PBR means patient bill of rights, notice to individuals, restriction requests, confidential requests. So we've gone down and, and we've mapped every requirement. Now, we wind up with less total number because what, uh, what OCR did in its 81 for the privacy rule was it duplicated a bunch that fell within a particular regulatory section where we folded those up and we consolidated them for purposes of simplicity. We address them, we just don't have a different one for each section of, uh, of uh, uh, for, for each different piece of a regulatory section. And then you get to the administrative requirements uh, of the privacy rule. Okay, so that's how, from our perspective, our checklists provide coverage. Now, I'm going to show you, after we go through the security rule re, uh, requirements and the breach notification, how a checklist item, what I'm showing here is a, a list of checklist items, but the checklist item itself provides much more than the description. It provides the policy. It provides the set of processes you should implement and the tracking mechanism you should implement for that requirement. There is a quick question about the uh, nomenclature, the convention, naming convention on the checklist. Uh, are those internally created by us or by you? Yes. PR is for privacy rule. AR means administrative requirements. And then the, it's the requirement within that section. If you go back here, uh, let me go back. PR, privacy rule, PBR means patient's bill of rights, 001, notice the individuals, this would map to, and we actually map it in our checklist item, that this maps to 164.520, notice privacy practices. And, you know, when restriction request is going to map to 164.522, if I'm remembering it off of my head, top of my head, and, and so forth. So these are, uh, yes, these this is our internal uh, naming convention. Um, we have a question here that I know you'll get to later. Uh, can you show an example of what is included in the 795 subscription, which includes checklist policy, process tracking, and I'll add training to that as well. Um, so I don't know if you want to cover that now or later. Well, we're going to show an example. Uh, and, and of course, you guys, like I said, if you go out here, let me, let me try this as an, as an experiment, and I, I usually hate to do this in the middle of a, a, a webinar, because God knows what will happen, but it should be la launching Firefox.
second if you give me a second here. Someone already tested it and said it works. Right. It takes you it takes you out to the look inside. You can click on the look inside is a a um, a book. It's not the entirety of the book of the product, obviously, or the we've uh, given it away, but it is a, a pretty user friendly way that you can uh, look at uh, what's inside on your own. Apparently, um, I think we're tapping the that connection. Thing is lo is, it's loading. It's loading too slow. So, but. We will talk about checklist items. I have an illustration of those, and you can go out and we have a look inside really for almost every product that we have out there now. So, um, okay, so we're back. Okay, so the same thing holds true for the security rule, and again, this is our naming conventions. It follows the naming conventions in the OCR protocol. So this is security rule, administrative safeguards, requirement one, one A, because the security rule contains a lot of process related stuff, especially related to how you do a risk assessment. This is really the risk assessment. That's why it's broken down into one. One, one is implementation specification one. One A is the first step in a risk assessment gather data in order to document your as-is operational environment. This is the description. We'll get to the checklist item in a second, right? Uh, SR, administrative safeguards, we're still on implementation one. It's 1B. This is the second step in how do you perform a risk assessment and so forth, 1C. And so in the security rule, because it's more process oriented, it, we, we broke it down into you can see that a risk assessment goes on through 1D, 1E, 1F, 1G, etc. And then you get to um, this is still the standard. This is the second implementation specification within standard one. So it's security rule, administrative safeguards, standard one. This is the second implementation specification, A, B, C, D, E, and this is where you you define your risk management program, those two implementation specifications make up probably 60% of the security rule. It's a huge part of the rule that has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with processes and things that you're required to do, like a risk assessment and like establishing a risk assessment uh, program. And see, we're so we're still here on two. Uh, and then we get to three. This is implementation specification three. It's a pretty straightforward implementation specification. It's still standard one. Implementation specification three, you have to have a sanction policy. Okay? Uh, standard one, implementation four, implementation specification four, for that standard, you have to have the ability to have activity review of your information systems. And then we move on to standard two within the administrative safeguard, standard three, and depending on whether or not there are multiple parts, you should be able to quite easily figure out the naming uh, nomenclature here. And you see that a lot of this is the administrative safeguards. We're still on administrative safeguards, and I think that probably wraps them up. So we're nine standards within the administrative safeguards, that's the nomenclature. That's what you see is AS009, Business Associate. That was the last standard within the administrative safeguards. And we go next. We chose to do the technical safeguards first instead of the physical safeguards because we just think they're more important. But the same applies. They have implementation specifications. And you, know, you can go uh, one, two, three for et cetera, for the first standard, uh, and on and on, okay? And then we eventually will get to the PS, which is the physical safeguards, okay? Now, 
well, let me ask. Is there any questions? For, uh, no, but questions? but I had an observation as I was watching you go through there in larger organizations, the privacy officer uh, would have the opportunity to take one of those state safeguards and or one of those procedures and hand it off to HR to do in terms of warning an employee, that sort of thing. So it even allows it to be broken down even further so the bits and pieces can be taken by others and effectively uh, completed. Yeah, this is not, the, I mean, that's a great point that Martin is making. This is, this is really, if it's going to be done right, it's a collaborative effort. And, you, you know, if you're going to get the kind of collaboration that you really need, you need to conv convince the executive team that, we're no longer in Kansas, and the game has really changed, and you're going to need probably an HIT consultant. You're probably going to need to spend some money, you know, uh, for a network monitoring tool and things like that to really help you do a real risk assessment and and so forth, you know. And, and you're going to need some of IT's time and, and, and some of everybody's time because everybody needs to be trained. So this is really a, a collaborative effort, not something that really should just be thrown on uh, the HIPAA privacy officer and compliance, or the security officer, and, and you know, here it is. Have fun. Go go do this thing. That's that's a recipe for. Uh, that's a frankly, that's a recipe for failure. Um, so, now the requirements for the breach notification are different, and if you looked at the OCR protocols, they treat them as different. They don't. So the requirement is, as we interpret it, is do you have a methodology in place for dealing with the breach? Do you know when a notification of breach is triggered? Do you know, do you understand, do you have it documented what, when the notification, uh, notification timeliness, what's the time period that you have to report? Do you know, do you have it documented, do you have sample uh, uh, notification content available so that you know what is required in the notification? Because you can't just put anything you want in the notification. It's controlled by the regulations. There are certain specific things that absolutely have to be there. Uh, do you know how it's going to be enforced? And are you managing incidents in a way that you could track a breach? Obviously, if you're not managing security incidents, then how on earth could you ever report a breach? You just don't know. So right, so, you know, right off the bat, just as a, a, a um, you know, seeing if somebody is awake, right? Uh, and, and, and what we're going to find, I, if I was doing the audit, I would say, show me your security incident management tracking system. If you don't have one, you're probably dead already with respect to the security group. Okay, so from a breach notification perspective, there are these foundational things that you have to have in place within your methodology that will give an auditor comfort that you are, in fact, prepared to deliver notification uh, and it's probably going to be not when, but uh, I mean not if, but when one occurs. You have, for the, for example, and just to wrap this up, you have model media letters, you have model HHS letters, you have model letters to the patient. If you have these things, and you can make a good faith argument that that you are prepared and therefore are meeting the breach notification requirements. Um, we do have one question on this. Is the main difference between a breach and an incident is that a breach is an incident involving EPHI and PHI? I th yes. Think, yes. Yeah. It's a little. Yes. I'm. I'm, I'm just, just thinking. Of how, how, it's a little more. It's a little more subtle than that. But that's that's correct. You can have you can have a security incident and right and a security incident was somebody was trying to break into your financial system. Well, your financial system doesn't have any, well, it might, but let's say, just say it's your accounting system, not, you know, and it likely doesn't have any EPHI, and so you would say, the first thing, the first part of your analysis would say, well, this is system that was attempted, uh, you know, whether it was an attempted or actual compromise, does it contain any uh, EPHI? If the answer to that is no, you stop. Now, you still may be in violation of some other laws, but you're, you're done with respect to the HIPAA breach notification analysis, because it doesn't deal with PHI, okay? And then another question, we'll show you a flow chart here because we, we answer these questions in our breach notification framework. We have a set of flow charts and we walk you through step by step. But another question would be, assuming that it was your uh, electronic health record system, 
okay? But it, if it was it encrypted, if it was encrypted according, according to HHS protocol, then you're done. Now you're done with respect to the analysis. What you do is you complete the security incident document, which we provide, and you say, yes, there was an attempt, but they attempted, uh, they, there was an attempted compromise of this particular system. This particular system is fully encrypted according to HHS protocols. Therefore, all EHI was rendered unusable, unreadable, and in, or indecipherable, and you're done. You've documented it. You're done. So not every security incident is going to be a breach, okay? But you got to log all of them. You got to log all of them. You can't just say we're logging the breach. No, because how do you know whether or not it was a breach? The only way you can know whether or not it was a breach is if you go through the analysis. So you log all security incidents, and then the ones that you can't rule out off, can't rule out out of hand you know you have to perform the analysis of to see if whether or not it was breached and whether or not any exceptions apply and whether or not then breach notification was triggered. So any any questions here before we proceed by step by step guidance? Not at this time. Okay. Um, okay, so here we're not going to show you all obviously our checklist items, but here's one. For the privacy rule, users and disclosure 001, first requirement, uh, violation of the rule. How do you determine there can't be a breach? Let's, and this is why it becomes really subtle and, and people misunderstand the relationship between the security rule and the privacy rule with respect to a breach. Let me just assert, and you can ask some questions along these lines if you don't understand. There is no privacy uh, there is no breach unless there's been a violation of the privacy rule, and one of the three exceptions don't apply. Okay, so the first part of the analysis is: was there a violation of the privacy rule? Well, that's a hard question to answer in the abstract. Our breach notification framework walks you through a process that says this is how you figure out whether or not the privacy rule was violated. So if there's no privacy rule violation, you're done. Okay, it may impact something else, but you know. And the second part of that uh, first question of the, the breach notification framework is: Was there a violation of the privacy rule of unsecured PHI? That's the second part, which says it's encryption. So here's the description. Here's the references for this requirement. Here's a set of policy statements related to this requirement, and our model privacy policies come right out of our checklist. We just get these policy statements and we consolidate them into uh, a, a, a policy. And here's a set of processes that you should implement to satisfy this requirement. Each violation or alleged violation, collectively violation, will be documented according to our documentation policy. Our compliance officer is charged with conducting a thorough investigation of each violation. On a yearly basis or more often at the discretion of our CEO, the CEO will submit a report. So these are the processes that you're implementing to see whether the, the rule was violated, right? and reporting out, and tracking. How do you track it? Violation documentation will be filed in the workforce member's personal folder or the business associate's electronic folder. This is where the repository comes in. That's what we're talking about. Verification that our violation process is managed according to our policy will be accomplished by periodic random reviews of violation documentation. Workforce members determined to have violated the rule will be sanctioned according to the sanction policy with all resulting documentation stored in the member's personal folder, personnel folder. So this is the way you track, right? These are the pieces, and we go through each one of these for each requirement in the privacy rule. Same thing is true for the security rule. There's the description. Here are the references back to the rule, and in many cases, references to the NIST special publications where you can go get some additional information. Here's the policy statement. It is our policy to maintain the data gathered for risk assessments evergreen by updating our as-is documents whenever significant changes occur in our operational environment. Changes to our operational environment will trigger a review of threats, vulnerabilities, and risks pertinent to the new environment, yada, yada, yada. That's a policy statement. That's, that's the organization's intentions with regard to risk assessments. Okay? But then here's the process that you're going to implement. And here are the tracking mechanisms that you're going to implement. And that was for just step 1A of a risk assessment. And then it's going to be 
1B, 1C, 1D as we uh, went through previously. Here's an example from the breach notification work to determine whether or not uh, a, a breach occurred. Uh, this is one of, I think, 12 or 13 flowcharts that exist in the framework. So was PHI paper? If PHI was paper, then you, you go to the notification analysis, right? Because the, the paper can't be encrypted. But if, if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't paper, now at this point we've already uh, identified that a, a uh, this is flowchart three. We've already skipped a couple of the entry flowcharts. We've already said that it, it, we already determined that it was a violation of the privacy rule. Now we're, we're trying to figure out was was it unsecured? Well. Even asking if the encryption was in place, was PHI at rest? So encryption, there's different encryption per different PHI states, whether it was at rest, in motion, in use, or being disposed, right? So if it's at rest, which most PHI is going to be at rest on in your database systems, on your file uh, servers, etc., you you review the at rest um, requirements for encryption. And then you determine if it's greater than or equal to the NIST protocols, then you're good to go. You can just complete the document in a because you encrypted correctly. If not, then you've got to go through the notification analysis. If it was PHI in motion, which means PHI that was being sent across the wire, then there's another uh, HHS NIST recommended protocol, and it's called uh, based on uh, transport layer support, I think TLS is what it is right now, but it's a verification, verification, it's a modification of SSL, and, and a lot of times it's still referred to as SSL, though it's really TLS, but so, you know, did we encrypt the wire the way we were supposed to encrypt the wire? So you can see that answering the question whether or not something was encrypted is going to depend on a lot of things, and, you know, uh, we could probably have another step here is, you know, if you did your inventory for your risk assessment, you can say, "Hey, is this is this is this implementation is this information system encrypted?" Because maybe you haven't gotten around to encrypting all information systems, right? And and so this wouldn't even apply because if that information system wasn't encrypted, you would go straight to notification analysis. So that's uh, an inkling of how you go about fulfilling. Uh, your breach notification requirements is showing that you got a system in place that will help you track breach notifications. This is just really, you know, a small piece of it. We provide you, uh, you know, an, an analytic framework that this is a part of. We provide you model letters, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, now tracking. We said that you needed to track your uh, visible demonstrable evidence at the level of a requirement. So we have these scorecards that we've developed for the privacy rule and for the security rule, and we didn't do one for the breach notification because it's a different kind of animal. And the no naming no nomenclature on the left is the same one that you saw before. This is PR uses and disclosures one, PR uses and disclosures two, PR uh, patient's bill of rights one, etc. And then here you give yourself a score. Zero means it's missing altogether. You haven't done anything, right? So this would say the way it exists right now, you haven't gotten started on your privacy rule implementation. One would be planned. Hey, we haven't done it, but we plan to do it. It's on, it's on our plan to get it done. Two would be basic. We have something basic in place. We just put it in place. You know, it, it may need to be refined over time, but we do have something in place. Three would be functional. Hey, we have something in place. We've had something in place for six months. It appears that, it, that it's working. We're happy with it. And, you know, four, E for excellent would mean, you know what, we've had this functional solution in place for a good couple years, and we're really happy with the way this thing works, and so we're giving it a four. Okay, and then you can use this to report out on a requirement by requirement basis where you are on a requirement, on each requirement of the privacy rule. Same thing is true for each requirement of the security rule. Same sort of scorecard uh, exists. Okay, now this is in rocket science, but it's a pretty basic, easy to use, straightforward way that you can track 
visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement of the rules. Okay. How do you track with respect to breach notification? The major question here is, do you have a breach notification system in place? Can you analyze a breach? Can you figure out if a privacy rule was violated? Can you figure out whether or not you have the right encryption in place or not? Um, and so forth. So we're at right about at an hour. We don't have that much more to go. Any questions at this point, Mark? No, sir. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the methodology that you should use to um, implement your initiative. And we like to talk about agile versus heavyweight methodologies. And uh, let me just start out by saying that na navigating this regulatory maze has proved daunting for organizations of all sizes, right? Now uh, confronted with HIPAA 2.0, which is no longer a paper tiger. And the methodology approach that you select is likely to make the difference between success and failure. And it turns out that most projects fail really because of people process challenges, really organizational challenges that have very little to do with the underlying technologies. For example, the security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project. Why? Because you're changing, you're really changing the culture of your organization if you're going to do a security rule implementation correctly. And learning how to effectively manage risk is a big part of that change. And it's not the compliance officer by himself or herself, security officer by himself or herself. It's the entire organization that has to be involved in the management of the risk. So an iterative agile methodology is required, but what exactly does that mean? So what is agile compliance? So agile is a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach. It uh, states that compliance solutions evolve through collaboration over time. It pro promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary, evolutionary development and implementation. In other words, it's not a big bang methodology. You're not going to get you're not going to get in compliance in the first month or the second month or the third month. You're going to have to work at this over a period of years or a period of years to eventually get uh, or approach full compliance. Agile is a conceptual framework that not acknowledges that due to a changing operational, technical, and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle really never ends. And although it's not expressly stated as that, if you read between the lines in the risk management program implementation specification, of administrative safeguards one, that's what they're talking about. This is an evergreen process and it really never goes away. And Agile is a way that you can incrementally begin to change the organization's compliance DNA. Essentially you want to fail forward fast. So what does that mean? Well get started, make some mistakes, learn from your mistakes, fix them and then move on instead of forming a committee to name a committee, etc. Why? Why do you want to do this? Because it's the only effective way of solving wicked problems. And wicked here means extremely difficult, not evil. Here's some characteristics of a wicked problem, and I can assure you that your compliance initiative is a wicked problem. You don't understand the problem until you've started developing the solution. In other words, each solution is going to be different for your organization. You really don't know what you don't know until you get started. So therefore, the biggest thing, advice we can give you is get started. That's the quickest way. Make some mistakes. That's the quickest way you're going to understand the problem. There's no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, and anyone that's read or looked at the privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rule knows that they're descriptive and not prescriptive. HHS doesn't tell you how to go about solving the problem, and they never will. There's no stop. There's no definitive problem, so there can't be a definitive solution. Solutions really are not right or wrong. They're just better than others, worse, good enough, etc. Every wicked problem is unique and novel because every organization is different and every solution is a one-shot operation. So it turns out that big problems like launching a compliance initiative, a HIPAA compliance initiative, require small solutions. Now that may seem paradoxical, but it's not that the ultimate solution is going to be small and trivial. It's that the ultimate solution is going to be built up of a lot of small solutions that you put in place incrementally and iteratively over time. So here's what you don't want to do is you don't want to form a committee to name a committee to study the problem to death because you're never going to get anywhere if you take this particular approach. Get started is really what you need to do. Heavyweight compliance, on the other hand, is focused on well-defined, otherwise known as TAME problems. Okay, Governance, compliance, risk management, people, process, platform. It's not that an iterative uh, 
methodology doesn't include these things. It just doesn't define, spend six months defining what they are up front. It gets started understanding that it's going to put pieces of governance, compliance, and risk management in place every step of the way. So heavyweight is a formal academic model. It's a static model. It's a linear model, step one, step two, step three. It assumes that you, it assumes that you understand, implicit in this, in heavyweight, it assumes that you understand the problem that's being solved. It's like building a bridge. We understand the physics of bridge building. You know, uh, 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 mankind has built thousands, hundreds of thousands of bridges. We understand the mathematics. We understand the physics. Building a bridge is not trivial, but it's a tame problem. We know how to do it. Standing up a HIPAA compliance program is wicked. It's wicked because it's got social organizational complexity. Building a bridge, generally, once it's funded, doesn't have social and organizational complexity. It has uh, technology complexity. So what's the so what? Well, the pace of innovation is accelerating. Everybody is competing in time, and I don't need to tell you guys how fast the uh, healthcare industry is changing, right? There's real risk today attached to high-tech HIPAA compliance, and it's growing every day. And look at the disruption that's happening in the healthcare industry, electronic health records, patient portals, paper performance, ICD-10, the Affordable Care Act, on and on. Quality measures that need to be reported, pricing transparency that is now uh, going to be a, a compelling issue, mobile health, you bring your own device, mergers and acquisitions. I mean, the healthcare industry is being turned upside down as we speak. Telemedicine, big data analytics, 150 years of change in five. Okay, and essentially, everybody's trying to develop that next business model that's going to deal with pay for performance instead of fee for service, and try to get and trying to get on that next innovation curve. And there's going to be a lot of consolidation, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Having an agile compliance methodology is going to help you deal with all the other change that's going on around you, and, and will continue probably for the remainder of our lifetime. So. Heavyweight compliance is big bang compliance. You're going to do it all at one time, and in a month or two months, you're going to declare victory, and really, you're going to fail miserably if that's the approach that you take, because big bang compliance means that you define all the requirements up front, which you don't know, right? Even if you get our requirements list, you still really don't actually know what that requirement is. You just have a list. You test all requirements for coverage, and you integrate all requirements into the workflow, and you roll this thing out in some kind of big bang way, and it equates to a slow feedback loop. And agile means define, test, integrate, and verify. Define, test, integrate, and verify. Define, test, integrate, and verify. Iteratively roll it out, make some mistakes, correct the mistakes, and then move on. Why? Because you get a fast feedback loop, and you can get uh, it's a quicker way to achieve a solution that's actually going to work for your organization. Here's some comparisons between Agile and Heavyweight. I will leave that reading up to you. Here's our risk management framework methodology that we borrowed from NIST. It's really a, a, a simple uh, methodology to describe. It's assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report, and repeat. Assess, simplify, monitor, simplify, protect, monitor, report, and repeat. Okay, so here's our shameless slide. We sell lots of compliance products, mainly all of them are available in a subscription plan for $7.95 per year, but we have some point products. If you would like to buy the point products, really be careful and we warn you that if you buy two or three point products, you're almost uh, going to be at the $7.95, you might as well buy the subscription plan. Uh, and we don't give refunds if you buy two point products and you come back. So we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients, we tell you how to do it, step-by-step -step guidance. We have educational projects, you can, products you can exit on starting on day one. They're agile. They're agnostic as to whether you're a business associate or a covered entity. It's wetware. Except no substitute because there is no substitute. Here you are. You can use these, this slide to go look inside a, a lot of our other products that were mentioned today. Just click on them, go out there and, and, and look inside as, as a good way to get a feel for uh, what you're getting. So <laughs> at this point we have 20 minutes left for formal Q&A. So. Okay, so 
We're up on Q&A. First question, and we have a few. During an OCR audit, do they or should we expect that they will start with the compliance officer and or the privacy or security officer for the visible demonstrable evidence? Yeah, that's the likely place that they're going to start because you have to have one. <laughs> if you haven't named one or you have that deer in the headlights look like privacy officer, really? Security officer, really? We need one of those? <laughs> so you pro they're probably done, right? So yes, they're probably going to start with that individual and they're probably going to start with uh, that individual plus who's the executive? Who's, who's the top dog here that sponsored this thing, right? I, 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 executives, the docs, whoever's running the show is not going to be able to claim, I don't know, I just delegated, you know, no, that's not going to work. So I would assume that uh, the initial meeting would be uh, with the executive or executive team plus the compliance officer and private officer. Okay. Um, can you state more regarding the social portion of HIPAA compliance? Social media portion? Uh, I believe that's what what's meant by this, yes. Right, so there's a whole lot of do's and don'ts, and really social media is a training um, exercise. For example, you know, the old, the old adage, don't say something in an elevator, uh, you know, that, um, that would reveal anybody's PHI, doesn't really translate to the fact that um, you shouldn't be using your cell phone to take pictures of patients when it's a family member or it's your best friend and you innocently take the picture because everybody takes pictures now with their phones and post that picture on uh, Facebook and it happens to be that everybody knows that you work at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital and so now you've just given away PHI and all you were doing was thinking you were doing having a little fun with your your friend or your family member and right? you just crossed the line or you have a patient portal uh, that is open you know that the, that the uh, exchanges are open to all patients that have logged in and you're responding to a particular patient's uh, PA, you know in, in a way that reveals PHI um, and so there's any number of things like that um, that should be covered in uh, specialized training we even have a social media checklist as to what you should do, you should have a social media policy for an internal policy, you should have a social media external policy available on your website, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a nuanced area and we break it out because it, it's so uh, context specific that we want to make sure that people address these things as they move forward implementing portals, et cetera. Okay. What is the difference between a business associate agreement and a data sharing agreement or data exchange application? Well, a business associate agreement, um, for starters, we, a brief definition is going to be an agreement that you have in place with a business partner wherein the business partner has to access uh, maybe create or modify, transmit PHI on your behalf, okay? A, a billing company, uh, a software as a service, EHR vendor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are all business associates. They're not covered entities. They don't, they don't provide treatment, right? So they're business partners wherein the covered entity shares its PHI so that the business associate can perform its business function on behalf of the covered entity. Okay, data sharing agreements and 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 some of these other agreements are are uh, usually agreements maybe for research, right? We're going to give you this PHI under these conditions. It was the identify the identify, but we're going to write up this agreement because you know this is how you're allowed to use this information. This is how you're not allowed to use the information. It's sort of a a CYA for these other types of relationships that don't fall into the business associate relationship. With um, regarding to certifications, do you happen to know why ISC2 no longer offers their HIPAA security professional certification? You know, actually I don't because, uh, I'll tell you why, 
I just haven't paid attention to all the certifications, man. They, I get dizzy looking at the three-letter acronyms that follow people's names, and I don't. Um, um, so I don't know what they are actually, you know. And we don't provide the kind of educational uh, training products. We provide products for compliance officers, security officers, and staff. But we don't provide products for um, certification as a, a CHIP or whatever, whatever that is. And so, uh, to be honest with you, I really, I really don't know. The last question we have uh, is about slides again, so if you would repeat that, that would be good. Uh, well, the slides were sent out, and they should be, you should have them. It should say PDF slides for ABC webinar or something like that with this date. And if you don't have them in your inbox, you should check for them in your uh, junk folder. If you registered late, I, I, I sent out the slides, I don't know, I think it was yesterday afternoon about this time. And if you registered after that, then you didn't, you're not, you didn't get them, right? So what you can do is you can s uh, send a request to support at threelinespublishing.com, and uh, I will forward you the slides. That was our last question. All right. Well, great. Thanks for being with us. And we have, um, n for next month, it will be business continuity uh, requirements under the security rule. Thank you.